Let me start then with the question of the future relationship with Europe, because I think that's with Europe, EU, um, because I think that's what the chair's question is alluding to. Uh, would it be sufficient to have a WTO relationship? Absolutely not. Uh, you could say that WTO commitments are basically the terms that you would have with any third country that you practically have very little integration with. It's very important to bear in mind that the UK does not necessarily have a trading relationship with Europe. It, it has an, it's basically an integral mark, a part of the European market. Uh, regardless of what the treaties look like, the, uh, the relationships and the supply chains and the economic exchange go far deeper than a normal WTO kind of relationship. And the WTO commitments are, I don't want to call them superficial, but they are, ex they are more of a life insurance policy or worst case scenario rather than an actual market liberation per se. Um, they are subject to great trade diversion from bilateral agreements and uh, thus you could say that WTO commitments today function more as an, uh, let's say, least, least possible level of decency that how, we, how two trading entities should behave against each other. And that's not what the, uh, if 50% if of the UK's trade is with Europe, you cannot have those terms imposed upon it. Um, and that is because in the unraveling of that, those single market relationships with the steep integration of supply chains, yes. the UK will suffer an economic loss as yes. Do you have any evidence to support that? Well, uh, there are plenty of economic evidence in terms of uh, what the WTO terms mean in terms of real market access or suppliers access as well. And uh, what type of trade, diver trade diversion we have seen in past liberalization. Well, you're discussing now with me what the WTO benefits are. I'm talking about what the e current EU benefits are of close access to that single market. Mm. Now, there are, um, there are certainly um, uh, empirical uh, evidence of what happens if the tar tariffs are increased uh, because there are countries who have tried to impose new tariffs or taxation in, uh, in, uh, as a substitute for tariffs and various types of unilateral discriminatory measures that could very closely approximate the type of trade shock that we will be looking at. What you're talking about here is this is non, I'm trying to elucidate what you're saying, is this non-tariff barriers in the service trade? It's both. Uh, there, are, there are several examples of countries uh, imposing trade barriers, yes, uh, that could closely replicate what we'll be facing if we return to WTO terms with the EU. I understand. Yeah. What I'm asking you to do, Mr. Mm -hmm. Makayama, is not to worry too much about whether we should take the Turkish model or whether it's a solution to the rules of origin problem or the Norwegian <coughs> model which leaves it with the rules of origin problem uh, off the shelf. But I'm asking you now conceptually to construct what you think we should ask for. Obviously the model that is closest to the current stable relationship with the most beneficial. I do, however, understood that the political realities in the you know, United Kingdom might be different. So the question is, in this two-way negotiation uh, between the, the EU and the UK, uh, will an EEA minus deal be acceptable? My answer is no. I don't think uh, there is a need in the interest of the remaining EU members to 
to accept it and something that deviates from the EEA template. 